give you an introduction and we'll get into our study. We're looking at verses 13 and 14 here in Ephesians chapter 1. We're looking at being sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so as is my normal way of giving Bible studies, let me give you some introductory comments. Then we'll move on into the, uh, into the study and see, um, you know, see what the Lord has for us tonight. So let's begin by saying Paul has been instructing the Ephesians concerning what they have in Jesus Christ. And we've gone through this, but let me remind you, they've been chosen, they are adopted, they're redeemed, they've been forgiven of their sins, they've obtained a heavenly inheritance, and they are to the praise of His glory. So all of these incredible blessings is the result of their coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said that they who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. He says that in chapter 2, verse 13. So this is how he begins the section, by saying, in him you also trusted. So when he begins by saying in verse 13, in him you also trusted, we need to remember that uh, the Gentiles are uh, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Jews did. He said the, Jew, the Jews were at one time the uh, recipients of the grace of God, but he's saying, you too have received that grace. So as I've been going through this with you, I've, I've uh, reminded you that the Gentiles originally were not considered the people of God. God called Israel to be his own special people, but he did not call the Gentiles in that way. Now, he didn't intend to ignore Gentiles. He determined to include them in his plan, and that was realized when the church was born and resulted by faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 9, 25 and 26, Paul said, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said of them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And so he develops this, and we'll see this in chapter 2 and chapter 3 uh, much more. But he's speaking concerning how these Ephesians who are Gentiles have entered into the kingdom of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he says in verse 13. Notice he says that they had trusted in Jesus after hearing the word of truth. In our day, somebody asks the question, is it important to share the gospel? There are those who believe that you can enter into heaven by living a good life or doing your best to obey God. There are people who say, this person is a good person. And somebody once said, the only person who was ever a good person was Jesus Christ, and they crucified him. And so the scripture says, there is none good, no, not one. Every one of us is tainted with a sin nature. And so we need a new nature. We need to be born again. And so no, you don't enter into heaven through good works or attempting to do something to earn um, a position in heaven. You, you don't enter into heaven by trying your best to obey God. And, and Paul has made it clear that that doesn't happen because you can't work your way into heaven. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, he said it like this. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law... Christ died in vain. So Paul makes it clear that people need to trust in Jesus, and, and, and in order to trust in Jesus, they need to hear the gospel. And that's why we're to share this message. That's why it's been called the Great Commission. In Romans 10, verse 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear? without a preacher. And so it's our calling as believers to take this message out. So yes, it is important to proclaim the gospel. You see, these Gentiles have been saved because they heard the gospel and trusted in Christ. Notice here that the gospel is referred to as the word of truth. Now, in various places, God's word is spoken of as word of truth. For example, Psalm 119, verse 160 where the psalmist said, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Or in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where Paul said, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, 
a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. And James, in chapter 1, verse 18, says it like this. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now, when he speaks here in this verse of the word of truth, it's called the word of truth because it's the message of reality. It's something you can trust. And that entrusting will result in an entirely new way of life. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus said it like this, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. That's where the transformation comes from. It's by embracing God's word that declares to you God's Savior, Jesus Christ, and God's promises that he gives to us by his word. And when you embrace his word by faith, you can do that because it's true. It's not a, a word of I hope or maybe or perhaps. It's a word of truth. And we as believers present the gospel in that way. So he says in verse 13, you heard the word of truth. He calls it the gospel of your salvation. So the gospel of truth has informed you concerning the one who is truth. What is it that Jesus said of himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so the gospel presents to us that one who is truth. And so this word of truth is, in fact, the gospel. And it's the gospel of salvation. He's saying you heard the word as it revealed the God of salvation. And as it revealed the God of salvation, you also trusted in him because you trusted that the message was true. You believed in the one revealed in the gospel. That's how you were saved. It revealed to you that God sent Jesus to save you. And you believed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the gospel of truth that we present where we say God was in Christ, took upon himself the sin of the world, died on a cross, was buried, but the third day rose again from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and from there he's going to return and to take us to be with him. This is the message of the gospel and the good things, the good news that we find within that message. And notice he says in verse 13, again, he says, in whom you also, having believed, he said, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we're going to be looking today at the sealing of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, when you believe the message, when you trusted in Christ, God sent you his Holy Spirit. Now, all of us know this, but let me say it. There, there is a difference, and this is the difference, between having a religious faith and being born again. To have a religious faith doesn't require a person to be a believer. You might find that interesting, but it's true. The religious faith may simply be a code of life that's built on religious principles. And so they speak concerning themselves as having a religious faith. But in fact, what they have is a belief in certain principles or things that they hold fast to and agree with others that this must be true. But that's not necessarily uh, um, saving faith. It simply means that you agree on certain things that these things may very well be so. But to be a Christian requires a person to be born again. And you're born again by the Spirit of God. And when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior... The Bible says that your body actually becomes God's temple. It's interesting. I was sharing this the other day someplace else where I was pointing out that in the days of Israel, when Israel was called by God to be separate from the world around, around them, the world around Israel during that day was filled with idolatry. And so all the peoples that the Jews were around all those peoples were idolaters. They had gods that they fashioned with their own hands out of wood or out of stone. But God called the children of Israel and he said, you shall have no graven image. So they were unique in their day and in the place that they were in that they were the ones who, who uh, worshipped what was called the invisible God. So they worship the invisible God, the God who said, you shall not worship me with your efforts. You shall not make unto yourself an image out of wood and out of stone. And so amongst all the people that Israel lived, they were the unique people who did not have idols. They would not have them. Now, 
in their nation's history, they fell into periods where they were idolaters. But that was against the commands of God. And so eventually what God did is God gave to them the law of Moses and ultimately he gave to them the uh, permission to build a temple. We know that King David wanted to build a temple, but God wouldn't allow him to because he was a man of war. His, his hands were bloody. And so he said, it's good in your, that you had in your heart the desire to build me a temple, but I never asked you to do that. Have I ever said to you, I want a temple? No, it's good that it's in your heart, but I never requested or commanded that of you. And because you're a warrior, David, you're not the proper one to build this temple. So what I'm going to do is I will have a temple built for me, yes, but it's going to come through Solomon, your son. And then after that temple is built, they had a tabernacle at one time, a portable place of worship. After that temple had been built, the, the nation of Israel would assemble. The um, males of a certain age, over 20, would come. They were required three times a year to come and to worship in that temple, if at all possible. So the Jews would come to the temple. And they kept coming to the temple from the time of Solomon all the way to the time of Christ. So during the time of Christ, what happens is Jesus takes upon himself human flesh. God dwells amongst men. And God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, brings the message of the gospel, ultimately dies on a cross. He is buried, he ascends in, in, to heaven after resurrection. And from that point on, what happened is on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on 120 that were waiting and in prayer. And now they became the temples of the Spirit of God. And so where at one time the people came to the temple, now the temple is to go to the people. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, you see? You have, if you're a born-again believer in Christ, you are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So people don't go to temple. We have become the temple. And as the temple of God, His Spirit dwelling within us, we go forth with a message saying to others that Christ can dwell in you and the Holy Spirit can make you a temple, the temple of God. But you need to have Christ. If you don't have Christ, you don't have a relationship with God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the second portion of that verse, Paul said, if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so you need to be born again. You need to have the Spirit of God dwelling within you because if you don't, you don't belong to him. Well, notice in verse 13 again how he speaks of the Holy Spirit. He speaks of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of promise. So he's called the Holy Spirit of promise because God promised to send him. In Isaiah 44, verse 3, God had said in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, I will pour water upon him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your children, my blessing upon your offspring. In the Old Testament book of, of Joel, in chapter 2, verse 28, the prophet said, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. I've been dreaming a lot lately. <laughs> your young men shall see visions. Well, Jesus spoke of this promise in Luke 12, 49, when he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. So this promise that was given, the promise of the Father, was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Now, one of the works the Spirit of God performs is the work of sealing the believer. And that's what he's referring to here in verse 13 when he says again, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. Now when he speaks of the sealing of the believer. Um, it speaks of the practice of closing parcels that were being shipped and uh, they would put wax on the parcel and it would be uh, be warm and so they would put wax on the parcel and then a person would have a signet ring and they would use that ring that had an imprint that was 
uh, symbolic of the family, of that person. And so after dropping the hot wax on the seal to seal that, that package, they would put their, their uh, signet ring on it like that. And in doing so, they were imprinting it. And so if I had a parcel to ship during that day, what I would do is I would go to the place to send it off, we'll say at a port, and I would seal it with my signet ring, and then I would send it. Afterwards, I would go to the port that I had sent it to, and I would claim it. And the way that I would claim it is I would show my ring's imprint as proof. And the imprint of that ring was proof of ownership. So after showing the imprint, I would claim the parcel as my own. And that's what Paul is referring to when he writes concerning being sealed with the Spirit. God has sealed us, and we belong to him. I'll give you some more about that and develop that a little bit further. In Scripture, sealing has at least three connotations. One, it represents a finished transaction that, reveal, uh, that uh, reveals a completed purchase. You see that in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah 32, verses 9 and 10, where it says, I bought the field from Hanam Hanamel, the son of my uncle, who was in Chino, uh, I'm sorry, in, <laughs> in Anatot, and weighed, out, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it took witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. So sealing one represents a finished transaction. Second, it reveals proof of ownership. So remember when Jesus died on the cross and he purchased us, he paid our debt in full, and in doing so, he really owns us. In John 19, verse 30, it says, when Jesus received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished is a single Greek word, to tetelestai, and that literally means paid in full. So when Jesus died on the cross and he cried out to tell us die, he cried out, it is completed, it is finished, the debt has been paid, and the debt has been paid on the cross when Jesus poured out all of his blood for us. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Paul said, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So God owns us. When Jesus died on the cross, he said the debt is paid. There's nothing to be added to this. There's no work that you can ever do. There's no great sacrifice I could ever perform that would be better than what he did on the cross. That's why it's that's why it's so, so um, it's just wrong for me to think that I, through my works, could perform something that Jesus himself couldn't. Jesus died on the cross for me so that because I couldn't do it, because I'm not good enough, because no matter how hard I try, I always fail. You know, the will is, is within me, but the ability to perform that which I desire is not. And that's why Paul would say, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? And goes on to say, thanks be to, to God through Jesus Christ. It's the Lord who does it for us. See, now that's called Christian faith. No, that's not, that's not copying out and saying, oh, I can just go out and do anything I want now that I claim to be a Christian. No, the fact is the Lord knows those who are his and, and the ones who belong to him depart from iniquity. Your life demonstrates that you actually know him. And then finally, Sealing represents security in Christ. The package makes the journey and is claimed when it arrives at its destination. And that's what happens to us as believers. God has given his promise to us. By faith, we believed. And by faith, we were saved. I don't know where it happened for you wherever it was. Maybe you were raised as a Christian. Thank God you were raised in a Christian home. For all of you who were raised in a Christian home, you ought to thank God every day if you gave your heart to Christ in an early, early age. You know, because I'm telling you, I remember hearing a young woman saying, well, you know, I don't have much of a testimony. She said, I was raised in a Christian home and I haven't ever really done anything that bad. In other words, they're not going to write any books or make movies about her in her neighborhood. That's not going to happen. And I remember the pastor, after she had shared that, walked up and he says, remember this always. And some of you may want to hear this, perhaps somebody watching tonight. 
He said this, and I've never forgotten this. He said, the keeping grace of God is just as beautiful as the saving grace. Never forget that. You know, if you were raised in a, in a godly environment, thank God for that. But then again, some of us weren't. Some of us were raised in homes that didn't have a relationship to, with the Lord. And you heard this message called the gospel. And, and it was like deep, calling unto deep. Something there began to tug at something here. And you may not have understood every single thing that you were hearing at that time, but you did know something. You did know you were lost. You did know you had sin. You did know that you were going to go to hell. But you also did know that there is a God who said he could save you. And I don't know how you came to faith in Christ, whether it was, again, at home, whether it was in a church service, maybe it was listening to a message on the radio. You came to faith. God brought you to to faith in him. Years ago, I went to New York. And while I was in New York doing a radio rally in upstate New York, outside of Rochester, in a place called the Finger Lakes, after the study, I had walked down to the front, which just visiting with people, those who were listening to us on the radio and all, and a guy walks up to me and he says to me, he goes, I want to talk to you for a moment. And I said, of course. He goes, I want you to know that, he said, I was driving and as I was driving, he said, because that's what I do for my job, I'm a salesman and I go from place to place, call to call. He said, I was, you know, just going through the radio and, and I fell upon this station and, and I heard this guy talking and I thought it was a talk show. He said, I thought it was a talk show. And so as I'm listening to this guy talk, he said, I started arguing with him. He said, because I thought this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He, and he said, and so... He said, I noted what time it was, and I noted what channel it was, and the next day I turned it on again at the same time, and I kept arguing with him. I just kept arguing with him. And he said, I did it again and again and again. He said, several days on, until he said, finally, I came to realize this isn't a talk show. This is a Christian radio program. He didn't know that. He says, and now he says, I came to realize that as I was listening, he said, God spoke to my heart. He said, and that radio program was yours. And he said, and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ by arguing with you about what truth is. You know, I just want to shake your hand and say hello. And I said, I hate you. Shut up. <laughs> but you see, it's, 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 it's how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit begins to, to tug on your heart. And maybe, maybe as he hits your hardened heart, I don't know how it was with you, but maybe a small crack of some sort will say forms. But before you know it, it's broken by him. And then you open your heart and you say, God, I need a, a healed heart because my heart is so messed up. And that's what happens. And so you heard the gospel. You gave your heart to Christ. You got saved. And that's what he's speaking about. And the result of coming to faith, becoming that temple is you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on in verse 14 and he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? The guarantee. That word guarantee in the original language is speaking of a pledge. It's a pledge that is paid as a down payment, guaranteeing that the rest will be paid. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is the pledge given to us by God to assure us of the glory of the life to come. You see, in Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul said, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom, he says, you were sealed for the day of redemption. You have been sealed by the Spirit, by the Spirit for the day of redemption. The day of redemption refers to when God claims us in the end as his own. You see, while we're still on planet Earth, our redemption is still yet to be totally completed. As we live our lives, we look forward to when we're going to be with Jesus. And in Romans 8.23, Paul said it like this. He said, not only the creation, but we ourselves who, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So there's still a process taking place that is going to be completed in the yet future. So the sealing of the Spirit marks us as belonging to God. It's our guarantee. The guarantee 
It's called the Araban. The Araban is a word that is used in various ways, but it includes an engagement ring. The Holy Spirit is God's engagement ring for you. That's kind of cool, I think. That's kind of cool. Um, it's God's promise, the Holy Spirit of promise. It's God's promise that he will always be ours and we will always be his. And he doesn't take the ring back. I did. Some of you don't know this story, so I'll say it. <laughs> Marie and I I asked uh, Marie to marry me, and uh, I did it at the home of my brother. He used to have a Bible study um, in Ontario, and, um, and I asked some of the original members of the Bible study to come. John's parents were part of the original Bible study I used to do when I first came to Ontario. That's how I, I grew to know this guy. And, and knowing he's such trouble, that's why I brought him on staff, so I could keep an eye on, on him always. But his mom actually made our wedding cake for Marie and me, so that's how far back we go. But anyway, I, I'll tell you this very briefly, because I thought about it while I was sitting there. God doesn't take away his engagement ring, and I, then I remembered, but you did. So anyway, <laughs> so I was there. I have, I have a ring that my father had given to my mom, um, and um, he had given my mom this particular ring so that um, she would marry him. So he used this little ring he had as an engagement ring. Well, it was given to me, and I had the ring. And so I was at the Bible study, and I read Proverbs 31, uh, Proverbs 31 woman, and I looked at Marie, and I said, this is, this is you. And I said, Marie... Would you marry me? And I gave her the ring, and she put it on. And then I went out and bought a, a wedding band and an engagement ring and cost me $200, and everybody knows that's pretty cheap. And, uh, but that's all I had. You know, you know, I borrowed it from her. If she'd have given me more, <laughs> she'd have got a better ring. <laughs> it's really your fault. But... <laughs> So she wore that ring for several months. But I was going to college. I was doing so many things. And, and before you know it, it felt like, like it was just unfair to, to keep her waiting. And I still remember um, sitting in a car with her and looking at her. And I said, you know, Marie, I said, it's not fair that I should not, um, you know, that we, we haven't gotten married. I said, I, I said I'm going to have to take the ring back. And I did. I took it back. And she handed me my engagement ring back, and I put it in my pocket, and I said, the next time I give you this ring, we'll get married. And so I gave it to her the next week. <laughs> and we didn't have a big wedding. We had a backyard wedding because I just said, you know what? It's time to pull the trigger. And that's what we did. You know, we just got married in my parents' backyard, and the rest is history. They said it would never last, but it did. <laughs> but it did. Well, God doesn't take his engagement ring back, okay? That's the whole point of the story. God doesn't take his ring back. He gave it, and he promised it uh, to us, and it's the Holy Spirit. So God himself is the one who seals us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit. In our hearts. Now notice again here in verse 14 that Paul once more emphasizes that this is all to the praise of his glory. You see, that's what salvation is all about, bringing praise and glory to God. You see, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of coming glory with God. The Spirit is a pledge given to assure believers of the glory of the life to come. And the Holy Spirit is intended to awaken us to the fact 
that this promise is true. It's not a dream. In 1 John 4, 13, we know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. In Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There are times that you might begin to argue with yourself. I'm not quite sure whether I'm saved. But you know what? The Holy Spirit within begins to actually awaken you to the reality that you are. No, you're not perfect yet. You're not. I am. No, you're not perfect yet. You're not. But you know what, man? Sometimes your heart can condemn you. Because you see somebody and you say, I'm not like that. Or how come they seem to have more joy than I do? Or God, it seems that their prayers are answered where, where mine just go as, as high as the ceiling and they seem to fall upon the, the earth unheard. I, I don't know. And, and your heart begins to, to question. Well, well, John says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. And when the Holy Spirit, when the Lord sealed you, the Holy Spirit of God is within you, there's a sense that I belong to him. And, and uh, I may not know everything, and I don't, and I may not be what I want to be, and I'm not, but I'm not what I used to be, and I'm knowing more now than I ever did. And that's what growing in Christ is. That's what growing in the grace of God and the knowledge of God is. So don't beat yourself up. Don't constantly condemn yourself. God knows your heart. It's desperately wicked, by the way. He knows your heart, but he's greater than it. And his grace is greater. No matter how far you go, his hand will go even lower to lift you out of the miry clay. Never forget that. Never forget that. And there have been times, some of you perhaps, I have awakened saying, how could I have been that? How could I have done that? How could I? I was in, in Mexico. I was a couple of years old in the Lord. I'd just gotten out of the military. I went with some friends on Cinco de Mayo. And we're somewhere in Mexico for a three-day binge. I mean, we drank so much tequila and so much beer. It's a lost weekend. And I remember coming home, and it was a Sunday. And my sister Madeline was seated across from me at the dinner table at my parents' house. She said, did you have a good time this weekend? Oh, Madeline, we had a great time. And I started telling her the craziness that we had been involved in there in, in Tijuana. In Sonata, actually. The craziness. She said, did you have a good time? I said, I had a great time. I had a great time. Then I stopped for a moment. It's 23 years old. I stopped for a moment, and I started to weep. I said, I had a lousy time. I said, Madeline, I have drifted away from Jesus. I can't take this anymore. And I cried. And she and I got in my car. We drove to church that night. And uh, there was an evangelist at the church, and he gave an invitation, and he said, there are some of you who are backslidden, and you know God is calling you back. You know it. And if you're that one I'm speaking to, stand to your feet. And I stood to my feet on that day. I still remember. I stood to my feet, and I said, yes, God. And I turned back to the Lord and kept following him to this day because my God is good, and his grace is, is greater than any sin I've ever committed. And it's the Holy... See, if, if, if the Spirit of God was not working within you, there wouldn't be a sense of grief. There wouldn't be a sense of sorrow. There wouldn't be a sense of shame. But, but because you're grieving the Spirit, He makes you aware of that. And, and that's what it is. And it says, oh, no, I have a guilty conscience. What you have is conviction. And the Holy Spirit is convicting you, and He's saying, no, this is not what I created you for. You're better than this. I made you in the image of my Son. You're better than this. I can do things you need to yield to me. So that Holy Spirit of God has sealed us until the day of redemption. And it awakens us to the fact that we belong to God. Like it says again in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are God's children. And so it concludes by saying this is all to the praise of his glory here in verse 14. So final thoughts. One, we are the purchased possession in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. And second, the work of Christ's redemption will be concluded when we are resurrected. In Romans 8, 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And third, this work is intended to be to the praise of his glory. And this is what salvation is all about, glorifying God. My pastor Chuck, and I'll close with this illustration, the story he gave. I heard it so many years ago, but it touched my heart. Some of us grew up with different little fables and stories. Well, he took a particular story and changed it a bit about the gingerbread, the gingerbread man. I don't know how many people here have ever even heard the story of the gingerbread man where a baker, a baker made a gingerbread man. It's a story. And as he made the gingerbread man, the story goes, the gingerbread man actually came to life. And the gingerbread man ran out the door and ran down the street. Run, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. You remember that? And so here goes the old man running down the street to get the gingerbread man. And finally, he catches up to the gingerbread man. And uh, Chuck's version of the story was, and he took him and he says, I made you. You ran from me. I chased you. I caught you. You belong to me. Well, that's us, isn't it? Run, run, run just as fast as you can. Well, he can catch you. You're not the gingerbread man. <laughs> but that's what the hound of heaven does. The Holy Spirit pursues you to the darkest corners, to the lowest places. And the Holy Spirit pursues you. And there you are by yourself, weeping, alone, rejected. Sorrowful, hurt. And he says, okay, are you ready? Are you ready to come home? And then you look up and you say, but look what I've done. And God says, I can make all things new. I can make all things new. Don't you know that the one who's in Christ is a new creation? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Don't you know that? My Holy Spirit, God says through his word, has sealed you into the day of redemption. It's a guarantee that I will be with you forever, forever. You are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So as children of the Most High, may we live lives that give glory to him. For again, he said, that's what salvation is all about. In Psalm 86, 12, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. Father, we ask that you would 